book a call so we can talk about what how we can get you on the right track because there is hope for everyone. There is hope for every situation, but it's not going to be easy. Hey, hey, everyone. I am Kristen Ostrander and welcome to the Amazon Files podcast brought to you by Mommy Income. I am really wanting to talk to you about this topic today. You know, I've been talking to a lot of clients and they're, a lot of them are wondering why they're stuck, where they're stuck, how they're stuck, and how they can just build more wealth. And so I really wanted to dig into this topic because we all have areas which we struggle and which we have strengths. And if you're practicing one or all of these wealth blockers, then maybe you can make some fine tuning going on and you can move forward with it because who wants to be blocking their own wealth? I mean, I surely don't. And as I was looking at some of these uh, different topics and different things that are blocking wealth, you know, this comes from a study of, a bunch of different, uh, well, the, some of the wealthiest individuals in the world, and ha- they've been studied over time and their habits and what they do and don't do. And so we're going to break down a few of these because it's really just important, even at the small scale of thinking about what's in our way when it comes to earning more or having more time or having all all these different things. And these are proven things over time that studying millionaires and billionaires and people with high wealth, no matter what their background or education level or anything like that, these are some things that we all can gain some more control over and some clarity over. So are you ready to dig into this? I certainly am because I know I'm guilty of some of these and I know I need to, you know, kind of focus in a little bit more on these 10 different wealth blockers and focus on one at a time. But first, I want to remind you, first of all, happy Cyber Monday. It is actually Cyber Monday, and I'm sure there's tons and tons of deals going out and around everywhere. And we have what I call a Cyber Monday slash Tuesday quick flash sale. For those of you who might have missed our birthday bash sale last year, this is your last opportunity this year at all to get any sort of coupon code for any sort of thing. If you want Wholesale Bundle System, we have a special Cyber Tuesday. I'm calling it Cyber Tuesday because, you know, we... Yeah, Cyber Monday is always full in your inbox with all the different things. So Cyber Tuesday, you can go to mommyincome.com slash system, get the Wholesale Bundle System for $100 off using coupon code Tuesday that is um, for you if you've missed out on wholesale bundles there's plenty of time to get this done through the end of the year so that you can start 2022 in the best possible way that you can start it and that's with doing wholesale bundles because that's one of the best ways to make money on Amazon. Yes, you're right. Okay, we do have some workshop seats left. If you haven't, you know, heard about the workshop, mommyincome.com slash workshop. This is in person. It's in Atlanta, Georgia, just outside of Atlanta, Georgia. We're going to America Smart. We're going to be walking through the trade show, meeting each other, building bundles together. It is so fun. I'm so looking forward to it. Um, Can't wait to meet y'all in person. And we just have a few spots left. So please grab your spot, mommyincome.com slash workshop. Okay, let's get to our wealth blockers, because that just doesn't sound sexy, does it? We don't want to be blocking our own wealth, and we surely don't want anyone else blocking our wealth. So what does this mean? Keep in mind, you guys, as I'm going through these, as we're talking about this stuff, keep in mind that this is for everyone. No matter if you are living paycheck to paycheck, maybe you're broke, maybe you're in the negative, this is coming from me, who has overcome a lot of financial instability in my life. Over $50,000 of debt paid off. Home foreclosures, um, hospital bills, broken down vehicles that were just abandoned because there was just no money to fix them. They weren't going to be worth it. We have had um, food insecurities in our time of being, when I say our, me and my husband have been married 22 years. We have three kids and we've been through all of these things, food stamps and hospital bills and injuries and workers comp and home foreclosure, more than $50,000 of debt that we took responsibility for because it was our responsibility. So when I'm talking about some of these wealth blockers and how you can get out of them, if it's possible for me, it's possible for you. It's over time, it's not overnight, but as you listen to these, I want you to guard yourself against that immediate uh, assumptions or, oh, that won't work for me, or that's great for someone like you, but you know you have no idea where I've been and what I've done. 
this is for everyone. Whether you are making a healthy six or seven figure salary and live in a great house that's paid for, or you're drowning in debt and wondering how where your next meal is going to come from, believe me, I get it. But each one of these, we can internalize, make it our own, and start to walk closer towards wealth, right? Because in the end, that's you're going to be you're in control of your wealth and the the things that are blocking you and you're allowing to block you. So we want to go through this and learn something so we can walk away with something. So there's 10 of them here we're going to go through, but pick one of them to focus on. If you're not doing one of these things, then maybe add it to the schedule or um, book a call so we can talk about what how we can get you on the right track because there is hope for everyone. There is hope for every situation, but it's not going to be easy. And I think that's what everybody wants nowadays. They want wealth. They want to um, take control of their financial freedom, their time freedom, their everything that they have. But when it comes to the work, they'd rather not. So those are the things that we're going to kind of talk about today. So number one, one of the biggest wealth blockers is not having goals. In a Harvard business study, there was some amazing statistics, and I love statistics, and I love numbers, and I love these different things because we can use those along with our common sense and along with some practical stuff to get moving. Not having goals. 83% of the population doesn't have goal, don't have goals? Like, what? Is this a thing? I remember at a time that I didn't have specific goals and I didn't really realize what they were, how they were. I was just kind of going through life like in survival mode. Do you ever go through life survival mode? You get up, you go to work, you do the thing, you cook the, the dinner, you make the laundry, you, you, you know, you make the dinner, you, you, you make the laundry. <laughs> the kids make the laundry. I have to clean it. Um, you go about your life just in survival mode, just getting through another day and 83% of the population is just kind of operating in this mode. Like day in, day out, they don't have goals. Now, 14% of people have a plan and goals in mind, but they're not written. They're not specific. They're just kind of like, oh, well, my goal is to get out of debt. Well, what's the plan for that? What's what's going on with that? But 3% of people actually have written down goals. And that number just blows me away. With as much technology as we have and apps that we have and different things that we have to be able to track goals and write things down and everything else, it really shocks me that only 3% of people have that. But what's most interesting about this is that the people that have written goals are like 10 times more likely to be successful in those goals than the people who don't have any and 13 times more likely if they have them written down. So the 14% of the people that actually have goals but they're not really written down are already 10 times more likely to become successful and reach those goals just simply because they have them. And then it's an extra 3% more. So 10 times plus 3 more times if you write those down. Y'all, just take that in. That is as simple as writing something down on a sticky note. My goal is to blank. Just writing it on a piece of paper. You have instantly made yourself accountable and you've made yourself 13 times more likely to succeed because you just wrote that down. Now, if you want to get super intentional, which we plan to in the hub next month about creating and setting goals for the upcoming year and maybe for a longer term, then you will really be hitting those goals and knocking them out of the water because you're already just naturally more likely to hit those marks when you write them down. But the thing is, is that most people aren't getting what they want in life because they haven't written down. They don't even know what they actually want or they know what they want, but they haven't really declared it to themselves, to their spouses, to the world, to whatever. I am going to do this or I'd like to do this. Successful people also take full responsibility for their successes and their failures. So don't look outside of yourself if something isn't working, you need to get super honest with yourself and to be accountable because honestly, no one's going to reach your goals for you, whether they're written down or in your head or whatever. No one is still going to take the steps that it takes to get there. So when you're doing this, when you're setting even one small goal, if goals are just overwhelming to you and you want to set just one small goal, you need to get honest about where you are and where you'd like to go and then look at an assessment of the past year. 
So say you started your business in January of 2021 and you're towards the end of the year here and you really want new goals for next year and you're, you need to take an analysis. Like what worked? What didn't work? What were your successes this year? What can you celebrate? We need to celebrate our successes because you know what? No one else probably is going to do that for us either. If you had to do it over again, what would you change? And during this evaluation process, it's really important that you don't blame anyone else or anything else for your successes or your failures. These are yours to own. It's yours to own. I know that's hard. I know that's tough. But I have had to own some failures this year as well. I have had to look at this previous year and realize what went right and what went wrong and what's going to change and what do we want for the upcoming year, both in business and personal. Listen, spend time deciding what you want. And guess what? There's no rules to this. There's, you know, there's no way for someone to tell you, oh, you can't want that. You can want whatever you want to have. You can, you can desire what you desire and then start making a plan to get there. So there's no right or wrong answers. Just say what you want. And if you don't know what you want, then start discovering yourself. Self-discovery is really important. What do you like? What do you enjoy? Wouldn't it be cool if? Like, fill in the blank there. You know there's something out there that you want. Something that maybe makes you uncomfortable to say out loud because you really believe inside that it's just not possible for you. I'm here to tell you that it is possible. Doesn't mean it's going to happen overnight. It doesn't mean it's going to happen tomorrow. But what about eventually? Would you like to have something eventually? What is that? Is it quitting your job and doing something full time that you love? Is it paying off your house and retiring early? Is it what is it that you want? What do you want? And then write that down. I want blank. And then align your choices with that goal. Whenever something comes up that could be potentially go on your calendar or your to-do list, somebody invites you to something, somebody does this, you want, you're thinking about, you know, that webinar that came across your Facebook feed or in your inbox and you're like, oh, should I go to this webinar? Should I watch this? This sounds really interesting. Ask yourself the question, does this get me closer to blank? What is your fill in the blank? Like I, I've been joking about like personal goals and, and business goals. And one of my personal goals is to win a cornhole tournament. I like to play cornhole. I just learned about a year and a half ago. Um, maybe, actually, it's been a little a year, well, 14 months or so that I've been playing. And I've told you guys a story before about my first experience that was really very embarrassing and quite quite a failure if you ask me, but I do, I want to win a tournament. That doesn't mean I want to be on TV or want to be a pro or any of that stuff. I just want to win one tournament at one point. And so when something is, is addressed on my calendar, um, does this align with this goal or that goal within my free time or my hobby time or my spare time? Does this align with that? Yes or no. If it does, great. If it doesn't, I have to evaluate whether or not that thing is important to me as well. So always align your choices with your goals. Is this going to get you closer to your goal or farther away from your goal? And some of these goals are short term and long term and some of them can overlap. But you have to ask yourself that question because we say yes to way too many things out of obligation or duty and we don't have to. We can be in control of that. We're going to cover that, I think, in step 10, too, because that's also something that blocks our wealth. So looking at your goals, what is that? Have a long-term goal, have a short-term goal, have many goals, but have something you write down and writing it down saying, I want to blank. I want to become this. I want to try this. I want to whatever that is. And then start aligning your choices with your goals. I mean, we literally could like mic drop and walk away right now with that. Are your choices aligned with your goals? Are you accountable for both your successes and your failures? How are you willing to examine yourself to see if you're on the right track, your own track? Which brings me to number two, wealth blocking. Did you know? Are you aware that comparison is a wealth blocker? If you are constantly looking at everything everyone else is doing and feeling envy or jealousy or sad or melancholy or, oh, I wish I would have or I wish I could have or I want that, change your comparison to a you versus you because you cannot compare yourself to somebody else's journey. 
That's like saying a pine tree is growing next to an oak tree. And this happens in Michigan all the time and where you're from. We have tons of trees and we're surrounded by woods. And it's like, oh, I wish I was a pine tree instead of an oak tree. Well, no, you're not. You are what you are. We all walk different paths. We have entered this journey, even if we're on the same journey, uh, selling online, e-commerce, selling, building businesses, whatever that is, we might be on a similar journey, but we entered the path at a different location. We entered the path with different baggage to carry. We entered the, the, the same path from different places, from different circumstances, with different financials. Some of us came in super broke on a shoestring budget, and some people came in with their life savings saying, this has got to work. No two journeys are alike. So it's very foolish to compare yours with somebody else's. Now, it's okay to have a goal that's similar to someone else's, It's okay to say, wow, she has a million dollar business. I would like a million dollar business for myself. But then you're going to take the journey and the steps that are right for you in that path because somebody else's path, they could have started faster than you. They they could have skill sets that you don't have yet. They could have money that you don't have yet or vice versa. You could have the money and not the skills. So stop comparing. It's really actually a very ridiculous thing. We were created as individuals. We have Everything is different. Everything. Even if you come from the same family as somebody, you are still different. Different skill sets, different gifts, different experiences, different emotions, different intellect, different personality. So just be you. Walk your journey. Only comparison you're allowed to make is you v. you. You versus yourself. It doesn't make a difference if you climb to the top of somebody else's ladder. You've got to climb your own. So stop comparing yourself, your journey, your finances, your business to someone else's and be proud and own what you've got, what you've built, where you're at right now. Because there's always room for improvement, even for someone who uh, appears to be at the top. Okay, so no comparison. That's blocking your wealth. It's a mindset that you need to get rid of. The only comparison you can make is you v. you. Another wealth blocker is consistent or constant skepticism. So always thinking that everything's a scam, always thinking that, oh, that will never work, always starting from the negative. Now, I know and I'm aware of the different personalities that are out there. Like my husband and I are so opposite when it comes to this. He is just naturally wired to see all of what I would consider like doom and gloom and negativity first. I am positive Polly, like, oh, always looking at the bright side, looking at all the great things that could happen. And he looks at all the negative things that could happen. And yes, you could imagine that this can be oil and water at certain points, right? But the reality is that we all need to have a little bit of balance of both of these, but we cannot constantly operate from a negative mindset that everything's a scam and nothing's going to work for you. Nothing's going to work for me. And woe is me. And I'm always the victim and I'm always the you know, all the negative side. I mean, if you believe you can or you believe you can't, you're right either way. So having a little bit of skepticism is good, but at the same time, you have to have a belief that things are going to work out for you because you're going to be determined that they will. Calling everything a scam or constantly assuming things will not going to be work out or that's not going to be right for you or people are going to scam you or take money from you is a very negative way to approach business, to approach opportunities, to approach conversations. Not everybody's out to get you. Not everybody's trying to use you. And yes, you might have very real experiences that this has happened. There are terrible people in the world. But with a little bit of homework, aka a Google search, you can validate any idea, any opportunity, and any person. So this recently happened to me. Um, You guys, I don't know if you know this, but like I get constant emails and DMs in my inbox everywhere about software people and people trying to sell me things and they want to partner with me and they want me to wear their jewelry on my Instagram so that I can promote their stuff. And I get requests all the time. And I'm constantly filtering the yeses and the noes and some things that are just like that doesn't even align at all and some things that do align. Uh, I have to dig deeper into that. Is this person legit? How long have they been around? What are they offering? Do they have any testimonials? Guys, uh, 15 minutes or less 
you can find out and validate an idea, an opportunity, a scam, anything else. Have you ever used Snopes, Snoops, S-N-O-P-E-S.com or something like that? You can look at any sort of opportunity or idea out there and people that have named names and, you know, stuff like that. So, you know, obviously we want to think about that. Is If it sounds too good to be true, it probably is, unless you validate it. Ask a friend, a coworker, a spouse, somebody that you trust, hey, look at this. Do you feel like this sounds real and legit? But also do your homework. Do your homework. If they don't have credibility to back up the claims, if they don't have that, if they, there's no, I mean, you can Google search anybody at any time and kind of see the credibility. I mean, if anyone has any doubts about mommy income or the Amazon files or the wholesale bundle system, just Google it. And you will find page after page after page. You will find testimonials. You will find real people who have real results with these programs. You can Google my name and you will find videos and all these different things. You can Google pretty much anything. So if you are feeling skept- skepticism around an idea or a business opportunity or an investment, just Google it and, and give yourself a time limit because we can all get lost in the research, right? So Google it and look, say, okay, this is pretty valid. These people have been around for a while. They know what they're talking about. They are industry experts, you know, anything like that that can show credibility. So don't fall for anything, but also don't assume that everything is bad and negative and not going to work for you. Skepticism always blocks creativity, which then also blocks your wealth. You could be saying to an opp- no to an opportunity of a lifetime, and all it takes is a really quick Google search to validate the people, things, ideas, opportunities that you're looking for. So don't always be skeptical. Be smart and validate ideas and look look into it, but don't fall for anything. And certainly don't give your credit card information until you have validated an idea. Number four wealth blocker, isolation and not making connections. Not sure if you've ever heard this phrase, but your network is your net worth. The people that you know, the people that are connected to you, how you're connected with other people. Have you heard any of these phrases? They're all, they've been around for centuries probably. Um, They're all common, like their strength in numbers. A strand of three is not easily broken. No one is an island. Many hands make light work. Great minds think alike. alike. Together we can do more. These are all real, together, in a community, with people, with like-minded people, with people with similar goals, similar ideas, similar ways of thinking, similar business. You know, if you're into something, join with other people that are into the same thing. We all have something to offer, and we all have something to learn. You are valuable to other people, and they are valuable to you. There's always something to give and always something to receive from any conversation, from any DM, from any email, from any anything. Reach out to people. Reach out via email, social, in-person events. Go to meetup.com. Go to Eventbrite. Go to a church. Go somewhere and gather with like-minded people, whether it's virtually or in-person or whatever. It is so valuable to just have a conversation with somebody else who understands what you're going through. Even if it's just a little coffee chat, you're not teaching anything, you're not, you know, exchanging money or anything like you're just literally grabbing a Starbucks and having a conversation about the struggle is real. You guys, that can lift our spirits so much, but also let's not get into a big gossip, you know, complaining fest where we're talking about all the things that are wrong and we don't have solutions. I hate those kind of conversations. It's like, okay, if we're going to talk about all the problems, then everyone needs to bring a solution as well and a possible solution so we can all talk about it right I have some friends that um, we get together probably once a month or so for like a happy hour and we you know it's virtual because we're all over the country and um, you know we talk about the different problems going on in Amazon but then we just also talk about real life and we try to encourage each other and we try to bring positivity to the table just as friends you know because it's also work but it's also you know just giving each other solutions and kind of being like yeah feeling needed and if feeling heard and seen is important to everyone at some level, even if you are very introverted and shy, it's still really important to make connections. So make connections in ways that you're comfortable. It's okay to sit and listen. So it's so much easier to have someone consistently talk and share ideas with and be able to do that, whether it's once a month, once a week, whatever it is, don't let another year, month, week, day go by without connecting with someone who can understand some of your 
pain and some of your successes and just have be like-minded. It's also intentional. When we talk about time, time is money, right? We don't all have as much time as we want to have, but these things are more important. These are things that the wealthiest people on earth do on a regular basis. They're not always ticking off the every single thing on their to-do list and button this little thing up and this little thing up here, there, and whatever. They're getting together with other people, sharing ideas, sharing concerns, sharing um, possible growth strategies, whatever it is. There's always people that have things to bring to the table. Young, old, new, does not matter the background or situation. As a matter of fact, I invite all of that because the more diversity, the better. The more different backgrounds and different situations and different beliefs come to the table, we all get more from that. So gather Go with people. If you're shy, if you're one of those introverted shy people and you're like, oh my gosh, networking is literally the worst thing on earth. Y'all, I get it. I'm not shy, obviously. <laughs> obviously. Um, but I still have to go over that in my head. I went to an event last week and it was like this charity holiday event. I literally did not know a single person in that room. I knew one, well, I, I knew of one, a few of them just from like one virtual meeting we had, but never really met in person and barely recognized their name or their face um, because it's been so long. But having, having a plan going into, and y'all, I'll be honest, I fought back and forth within my head and heart about whether or not I was even going to go to this particular event because I'm like, oh, I don't know anyone. It's going to be awkward. What if I have to sit by myself? Like these are like middle school lunchroom kind of feelings, right? I mean, you feel me? Like we have, you know, th these moments. I have them too, even though I am pretty conversational and, and not shy and willing to pretty never met a stranger. I still struggle with walking into a room full of people that I have never met before and don't have anyone with me. And, you know, I don't have a safety net. But what I do is I get ready for conversation. People like to talk about themselves. So in in, in being ready for a conversation, you can introduce yourself. Hi, I'm so-and-so. This is what I do. What do you do? Or what do you have children? Or, you know, give a question and then just be ready to, to listen. That's all you really have to do. Have one question ready. Oh, how did you find this event? Who are you connected to? What is it that you do? Whatever it is, and let them talk. And then... When they're, they're done talking, you lean to the next person. How about you? And then let them continue to talk. This is a great way for shy people to network because you get to listen and take everything in without having to do a lot of talking for yourself. Because honestly, what do we really have to lose? Pride? Ego? Like, honestly, if you walk out of a room and you talk to three people, you talk to three people. That has value. And three people talk to you and got to know you. Even if there was 50 people in the room and I probably talked to five people. But the reality of it was that I now know those five people. I know what they do. I have their business cards. I have so having that having that meeting was really important. And now I know I have a real estate agent I can work out reach out to. I have someone that works at Comerica Bank that I know I can now reach out to personally because I have her card and her number and I have these questions. So these things, your network is your net worth. And even if you think that people don't have anything in common with you or you don't have anything in common with these different things. People know things, and when they're coming there, they're also willing to share. So think about all of those things. And what do you have to gain? Everything. You have another person in your network that might know something that you don't know that has value, that's willing to share with you, that's willing to do these things. So don't do this alone. And you don't have to do it in person. There's virtual everything now. I'm connecting for people all around the world because, thank goodness, for Zoom, right? So reach out to someone. Be as awkward as you can be, but still do it because doing it alone is where it was when most people quit. When they feel like no one understands, no one gets it, no one, my spouse has no idea what I'm going through and they don't want to hear another thing about it. Great. Connect with people who do. I'm, I promise you, you can find someone that's like minded, that you guys can share ideas and do all that. Isolation is a wealth blocker. You cannot do it alone. You can't. Number five constant consumption. Now, this is more prevalent than ever before. Constant consumption, always consuming social media or and podcasts and TV shows and reading and articles and blogs, and you're constantly in a learning phase, but you're not in a doing phase. And there's a time and a place, and for everything, there is a season. There are definitely seasons of learning, but there's also doing. Always listening, but never practicing. 
buying and not selling, watching and observing, but not getting into the game. The sidelines is not where the magic happens. The magic happens on the court. The magic happens when you're in the game and you're playing. Even if you're falling and you're stumbling and you're hurting yourself and you're looking like the biggest idiot out there, you're in the game. Get in the game. Doing is the only thing that matters. I don't care if you have a PhD in something. If you are not practicing those skills on a regular basis, you're rusty. You're not going to just, just because you have a bunch of head knowledge doesn't mean that you've put that into practice. Have you ever learned something and then you tried it in real life and realized it's completely different than what you really learned and you've got to kind of get the hang of it? I mean, I don't know. I'm just going to put this out there and I know it's going to sound a little harsh, but you all know I love you and I want you to grow and I want to grow. I think we've become a little bit wimpy. We're all afraid of things being so hard. It's like we have this expectation that building wealth and building, you know, extra zeros into our bank account is somehow going to be easy. No, it's not easy, but it's worth it. Because you food stamps, unemployment, being stuck into a job with a boss who belittles you and treats you like garbage and you feel like that's the only job you can get right now because it's just comfortable and secure so you put up with it. Y'all, that's hard too. Pick your heart because either way it's going to be hard, but it's not hard forever and it's way more rewarding when you're doing it for you, when you're not doing it for somebody else. So stop consuming and start doing you can be fully trained if I know how to play guitar and then I never played it do I really know how to play well yeah I know how but I just never play well eventually you're gonna forget you're gonna lose those skills so this is when we need to stop consuming and start doing put limits on yourself I don't, I'm not saying you can't have any fun. You always have to be, you know, working or stuff like that. We can talk about time and mindset and all that kind of stuff because I think that's really important. Balancing rest and relaxation and hobbies and fun with hard work. But there's got to be a balance. You can't just constantly, oh, I'm still learning. I'm still researching. I'm still learning. It's time to start doing. How do you know if you're even going to like something if you don't actually do it and try it? And guess what? You can't judge it by the first few times you try it because you're not going to be good, right? You're not going to be good at something that you just learned how to do. You got to have permit. I'm giving you permission to like suck in the beginning. You're going to be a beginner. You're not going to be good at it. That's just how it is. Our kids, when they learn to color, they color all over the place. The colors don't go together. They don't, they write too hard in one place and then too light in the other place. They color outside the lines and it kind of looks like a disaster. But we're proud of them because they produced something. They tried. And eventually with little pointers to say, oh, maybe you can match these colors together. Maybe you can color inside this line there. Or just make a free abstract color, whatever it is that you want to do. But you're doing something. You're putting your hat in the ring. You're giving it a try. So constant consumption is going to block you every time because you just need to research a little bit more, right? You need to just look up a couple more data points just in case. You need to overthink it one more day. And one more day goes by that you didn't have action, that you're blocking your own wealth because you just didn't put it out there. Did we die though? Did you die? You're not going to die if your ego gets hurt, if your pride gets hurt, if you lose a few hundred dollars. Trust me, I know. You've got to be able to have the faith to step out even when it's uncomfortable, even when it's hard. Stop consuming, start doing. Speaking of that, speaking of comfort zones and failures and things like that, number six of wealth blocking is avoiding failure. Do you know that people spend, there's a lot of people that spend most of their life and that's exactly what they're constantly doing. Instead of trying to build happiness and build success and build a life they love, they just constantly run around trying to avoid bad things. Oh, bad things could happen there. This could happen there. This could happen there. So I'm just going to stay home. I'm just going to stay in my bubble. I'm just going to stay over here. I'm just going to do over here. Constantly 
living under the what if I fail. Now, last week's episode was all about failure and what if I fail and those sort of things. So we're not going to go over this really heavy because I did a whole episode on it last week. So go back and listen to that if you haven't listened already because it's a good one. Um, It's really about the what if monster and the what if, what if, what if. And if you're a what if person, which we all are at one point or another, you need to hear that episode. Save it as a fave because sometimes we just need that extra motivation and encouragement. But avoiding failure never gets you what you want. It's no risk, no reward. If you don't take any sort of risk, you're never going to get the reward that you want. Staying comfortable seemingly has its perks. But what are you giving up? Because for everything that you say yes to, you have to say no to something else. So if you're just going to say, oh, I'm just going to stay comfortable, that seems really scary and hard and I don't know what I'm doing, so I'm just going to sit here and, and watch Netflix and chill on the couch. That's great. You said yes to that. But what did you say no to? The possibility of building some more wealth, the possibility of making a connection, the possibility of something that could get you closer to your goal, because I can tell you right now, Netflix is not part of that. It doesn't mean you can't incorporate Netflix into your life. So don't hear what I'm not saying about that. But what I'm saying is, if you're avoiding some of the things that you're doing because of the failure factor, you need to really remember every time that you always have two options. You can step forward into growth or you can step backwards into safety. That's a quote by Abraham Maslow. He was a American psychologist, psychiatrist, and wrote a bunch of stuff on human needs and all this kind of stuff. I've never really read a ton of his work, but I did read a really good comprehensive like blog post about that. And I just love that's so true. We can always we're always going to be stepping. Are we stepping backwards into comfort, comfortability and, and what I call false safety? Like, okay, I'm safe here because I don't have to take any risks. But that also means that you might have to live with regret because you didn't. What happens if I would have? Or we can step forward into growth because even if you fail, you're still growing. That's the benefit of it is even if you fall on your face and fail and you lose a bunch of money or you make a big mistake and you're just you're embarrassed and it's like all is lost pity party. Y'all, I've been there lots of times. As a matter of fact, I've been there several times this year and not too long ago, the past few weeks. It's not a pretty sight. And I give myself time to feel the failure, to understand it, to evaluate it and just own it. Yeah, I screwed up. I spent way too much money on this and not enough money on this and didn't pay attention to this. And now I was moving forward really fast and had a big failure happen. And it's not comfortable. It's terrible. But that gave me growth because now I know what not to do next time. I know exactly what not to do. And there will be a next time because I'm not going to sit at the point of failure and be like, oh, well, this is it. I give up. Y'all, I don't give up. It's like a blessing and a curse. But that's the thing. I could just give up and be like, okay, that's not right for me. I'm going to move somewhere else. I really failed at this. Or I could say, you know what? I've learned something really valuable here. These are all the things not to do. And that mistake cost me this. But knowing what I know now, I can walk forward and actually make money now that I know I'm not going to, I got that mistake out of the way. Right? So... You've heard of beta programs, right? Like the beta is like, okay, it's open for feedback. It's not quite done yet, but we're still inviting people to come in and try it. It's not quite finished. It's like we need to look at our lives as like a constant beta. We're like, I'm a work in progress. I am never going to be finished. I am open for feedback. But the only people that are allowed to give you feedback that's valid is if they're playing the game too. The people that are hanging out on the sidelines and they're not in it and they're not practicing and they're not doing it with you, they don't get to say anything. Their their words, their, their feedback, their criticism, their whatever doesn't carry weight because they're not in the game with you or they haven't played the game. Now, if they have and they have some valid feedback, then we should be leaning in and listening up because they've been there and done that. It's somebody that's wiser and smarter or have been there and done that. We can learn from them. But we don't have to take criticism and feedback from people that are just bystanders that just have an opinion because everybody's got one. Um, whether or not it's valid for you is, um, you know, something to you to evaluate. But it's just like anything grows under pressure, right? Diamonds grow, uh, diamonds turn into diamonds with time and pressure. 
um, sore muscles, right? When you work out and you're sore, that is the growth stage. When they're sore and they're recovering, that's when they're building. But you can't get the proper growth without some of the pain, right? There's always going to be some pain or uncomfortability that you're going to have to deal with in order to grow. So avoiding failure is a surefire way to block all of your wealth. You might as well just stand still or walk in a circle. Because if you're constantly trying to avoid failure, you're never going to grow. Number seven, short-term mindset. Okay, I'm going to admit this one here. This has been uh, my MO for a lot of my life. Always looking for the quick fix, the quick win, the success right now in the moment. Like who has time for the future? I'm at, I'm at now now, you know? Um, but success and wealth building is a slow, consistent process. And I kind of had to learn this the hard way. I wanted everything to be fixed right now. I, w- I For many years, back way back in the day, when I was trying to pay off debt, I just was constantly trying to save like a lump sum and then just pay it all off and pay the minimum payments, things like that. And then I would get this lump sum and I'm thinking, oh, I could pay this credit card off or I could do this, spend this, go here, do that, or use half of it. Instead of diligently and quickly spending $5 at a time to pay off the debt, which is what I did to eventually pay off the debt for over $50,000 of debt. In cash, paid in full, slowly but consistently. But I was definitely addicted to those quick fixes or early on. You know, I wanted to sell something right here and now. I wanted to try to flip something that wasn't going to be long tail, but was just going to be right now. And the thing is, is I realized that that was stunting my growth because I wasn't looking at what the long term was. The most of the time, it's consistency. Whatever you do consistently, consistently are the results you're going to see. So if you put $5 in a jar every single day for an entire year, $5, that's it, into a jar every day or into a bank account or into somewhere else every day and it's just $5 and you never look at that, all you do is $5 a day or a dollar a day or 50 cents or a quarter and you never touch it and you just consistently take that action, that will add up over time and it will add up more than you realize. You probably won't miss it. And you realize, wow, I saved however many dollars. I'm not, not even doing the math right now. But like you guys get it, right? It's over time, not overnight. Healthy wealth building is slow and steady, period. There's no other fancy, sexy answer for that. Now, you can get aggressive if you are getting to a point where, you know, you're, you're approaching retirement or your body's given out on you and you need to retire because, you, you know, whatever reasons, all kinds of stuff. Then you can be a lot more aggressive about your consistency, but it's about what you do consistently over time. Like, um, you know, if you talk about people that have been on diets, we've all been on diets, we've all wanted to lose some weight, get healthy, exercise, whatever else. But studies have shown over and over that you are your results are accumulative efforts of your consistency. So like one major Thanksgiving binge where you're eating all the things and dessert and pie and like four rolls with butter. I mean, that's just my Thanksgiving. I don't know about yours. <laughs> but those times, I mean, I love bread and carbs and all that kind of stuff, although I try to abstain a lot of times. Anyway, that one day of Thanksgiving binging is not how I eat regularly. So I'm not going to beat myself up about it if I have a giant Thanksgiving over stuff like unbutton your pants or like wear elastic because you know you're just going to be super bloated and stuffed. Great. But that's not my consistent way of eating. So I can't measure my results based on one indiscretionary meal or day of eating. It's your consistent habits over time that add up to what your regular activities are, your results are. So it's regularly eating a little piece of candy here, a little piece of candy there, this and that, that that add up, right? So that's something you have to take a snapshot of over time and looking at that, having more of a long-term mindset. 
I struggled with that too because the small repeated steps over and over are what get results. And I've always struggled to look at very big picture, like five, 10 years from now, how do you see your company? And I'm like, I don't know. I have no idea what's going to happen in five or 10 years. So much can change in that period of time that how dare I plan something. However, how about a year? How about just stretching yourself beyond your normal comfort zone? Like a year to a year and a half is about as much as I want to plan because you just don't know. And that's just my personality. Some people like to have 10 year goals, all that kind of stuff. I mean, I have some longer term ideas I'd like to have in the future working towards those, but I will struggle in that area because I've, oh, my personality is very much of a quick start, very much of like a right now here in the moment. Um, so when you find yourself struggling with that, you need to take a picture, a, a, take a, an assessment of the long term. The long term, meaning, okay, if you're struggling to go forward, look backwards at the past five years and how you've come and realized, oh, lots can happen in five years. I can grow a lot. I have grown a lot. I've changed a lot. These types of things. So not just how many sales have I made this week or this month. How many sales have you made year to date? And compare that with last year. Better, worse, the same. I mean, having the longer term mindset helps you stop trying to make those quick fixes in the moment. Sometimes something doesn't need a quick fix. It needs something that has more of a long term solution. So having that short term mindset is something that we need to work to get rid of longer term. Remember your goal statement. Is this choice, whatever this choice is, going to be me, bring me closer to where I want to be? Think bigger, think longer, and then step smaller. The steps are small, but the goals are big. So one small step to get a little bit closer to where you want to be. Number eight, wealth blocker. Being unaware of your financials. Very unaware. If you don't know where you are, how can you navigate where you're going? That's like having no reference point and you know, like, okay, you put something in the GPS, but the GPS has no idea where you are. I mean, the GPS always knows where we are, right? But the idea there in your life is, well, I want to make a million dollars. Okay, well, where are you right now? Are you making $5? Are you making $10 million? Are you making $10,000, $100,000? Like, where, what's the gap? Because how do we know how to fill the gap if we don't know what it is, right? There's very simple things that you can do to track the basic expenses. I'm going to say this one more time for the people in the back, or maybe you're distracted by the car next to you or somebody else walking their dog or God knows what else and you didn't hear me. So I'm going to say it again. There are very simple ways to track the basis to know where your financials are. Incoming outgoing. Yes, I have an accountant, I have payroll, I have taxes, but I do all my own bookkeeping. By day to day, well, I actually do it once a month, monthly bookkeeping. It's the ingoing and the the incoming and the outgoing. I use a spreadsheet. I look I print bank statements every month and the statements that come in with all the money coming in and all the money going out and I look at that and I balance it and I put it into some simple categories. Why? Because if you do not have your finger on the pulse of your business, you could be losing money and not even knowing it. You think because Amazon keeps depositing money into your account that you're making money, right? I mean, hey, Amazon sent me $5,000 today until you look at the fact that your credit cards are $15,000 that you use to spend that. And then there's something you don't want to take longer than a month to have this stuff pile up. Be aware in your business. Be aware. What's coming in? What's going out? At any given moment, I should be able to ask any of you, what's your profit for this month? What are you making? What, what is your break even? If you don't know your break even, be scared of me. <laughs> I'm really not scary, you guys. But like at any moment, I should be able to say, hey, what's your break even for the, mo for the month? In other words, what... How much do you need to bring in in order to break even? That means whatever you're paying for in monthly subscriptions, whatever your minimum debt payments are, whatever your taxes need to be eventually, divide that by 12 and figure out how much it is. What is it that you need to bring in to break even in your business? That's some, a number that you should always know. This you should always know. What's going to cover your payroll? What's going to cover your salary? Or what's going to cover your expenses? What you have? How much inventory? Blah, blah, blah. Like, what is your break even? Because if you don't know that, 
then how do you know if you're doing well or what you need to improve or how you need to hustle this month? Like, what if your break even is $1,000 and last month you made $750? You're below break even. That means somewhere there's going to be a loss. There's going to be a cash flow issue. Maybe it's tied up into inventory and so you need to figure out how to move it faster. Or you know that maybe it's a slow month, but Q4 is going to make up for that. But if you know the snapshots over time, then it's easier to do that. And really, bank statements and spreadsheets are all you need. And I don't mean complicated spreadsheets, y'all. I am very basic. This plus this equals this. There's no formulas, really, that I have. So it's just like tracking the expenses. How much did you spend on inventory? How much did you spend on supplies? What did you pay the prep center? These types of things. And overall, what is that going to be? Just know your financials. If you're very uncomfortable with this, if it's something you're like, oh my gosh, I hate bookkeeping, but I know this is something that's blocking my wealth. There's some services that we trust. Um, LWTServices.com with Chris Loveless and his team. Um, they do for e-commerce. They do your bookkeeping with Amazon. They will help you with that. They will help you with tax preparer, um, tax repairing, all that kind of stuff. Also, if you're if you want to read uh, Profit First for e-commerce um, by Cindy Th Cindy Thomason, and all these links will be in the show notes for you, or even Profit First by Mike McCallowitz. Now she has teamed up with him to be able to write the one for e-commerce, which I think is really helpful for most of you. So I would start there. Um, but if you just don't want to handle it yourself and you're done being unaware of your numbers and all that kind of stuff, then um, LWTServices.com, please mention that you heard it with Mommy Income so that Chris is aware of um, treating you as the best clients that he can treat you because they're awesome there. So um, if you're unaware of all those things, you need to become aware. That is a number one wealth blocker. I mean, how do you know if you're going to reach your goals if you're not actually looking at your numbers? And I'm not talking about splitting hairs specifically on Amazon. I'm talking about starting with basics, incoming, outgoing, and then you can start getting super into the nitty gritty later. But if you're not even at the basics, you need to get that squared away because you need to know um, whether or not your business is profitable. Okay. Reli uh, number nine, relying on one income stream. Now, this is a little bit more advanced because there's some of us that are in situations where, you know, building one income stream is still what we're working on. Like, we're barely building one income stream. But overall, whether, I mean, I know it's really difficult, but it's worth working on. So some people are single people by themselves. Maybe you're a single parent. I get it. You're one person. It's hard to have a job, let alone a uh, job and responsibilities, let alone like trying to create an additional income stream. But there are definitely some small practical steps that we can do to move forward into wealth building with building more than one income stream. First of all is finding money that maybe is like I, I say I call it plugging the holes in your bucket. Everybody's got holes in their bucket somewhere. You just have to find them. Um, are you paying for a subscription that you no longer enjoy or are watching or needing and you, it's just constantly coming out of your bank account? Like if you're not really watching Netflix or Hulu yet, you've signed up for it, cut the cord. If you miss it in three months, come back to it. Like every, nothing's really written in stone unless it's one of those things where you're on a cheaper payment plan. And if you're using it, great. But if like, like for example, I know some people are like, have like founders. <laughs> They're like founder fees or like you started at something that's really cheap and now the price has gone up two or three times. Now those are something things to evaluate. But like if you're not using it, if it's not something that uh, you value on a regular basis, then it's time to cut the cord and just see what happens. Could you live without that? Could you have a is there stuff that you need to take back or send back to Amazon to get refunds? These are all things that are money in your pocket that's slipping away um, as have you dealt anything have you dealt with Amazon in a way that they have sent you returns that are you know need to be followed up on is there discrepancies on your bank statements is there discrepancies in your credit card statement whatever these things are pay attention to them as that's money in your pocket but investing is also a really good resource to to start doing it's, it's a you can pay dividends it's like your money's working for you um, and so that's another income stream that whether it's passive or some mon your money is working for you, it's something to pay attention to. Uh, if you're not at a point of investing at this point, I didn't think I was either until I started a Robinhood account, which um, go to mommyincome.com slash Robinhood if you want to know what that is. It's basically an app that 
will, you can put a certain amount of money in it. You can start with $3, $5. You can buy stocks that are really cheap and you just, you know, can add money to it whenever you want. And there's no, it doesn't feel like stress. Like you can look up any stock you want and buy a share or buy a quarter of a share. You can buy cryptocurrency. You can, you know, different things and you don't have to spend a lot. You can literally start with $5. Gone are the days where you need a financial advisor and you have to walk into a place like that and, and have at least $10,000 and start investing. Now, I definitely advise that you get somebody that's really smart and a financial advisor that can help you with that. But getting started doesn't have to be that way. Y'all, I didn't do it. I opened a Robinhood account when my son a few years ago was like, hey, I got this new investing app and, you know, I got a free I got a free um, stock and then I bought some of this and bought some of that and I've already made 500 bucks. I was like, Psh. He can do that. I can do that. And sure enough, I was just like, oh, I think I'll buy stock in this. And I buy one share for 20 bucks. And then I, well, next week I'll buy a share of something else for $10. And pretty soon over the last couple of years, I've got 20 grand in there. And I, I, it's just like some of it happens automatic and some of it's growing. And you, it's just one of those things that we make excuses for if we don't have it because we don't know or we don't know what we're doing. But technology has made it so much easier. You could literally be investing $5 a week five dollars a month like it doesn't have to be expensive or hard so mommyincome.com slash robin hood if you want to know more about that i'm sure some of you know other apps please leave them in the comments or things that you like to use we're always open for suggestions on things like that um if you use a better one a different one i know there's many out there but robin hood seemed to be um very easy to use user friendly it's also easy to withdraw your money when you want it it's in my bank account within 24 hours if i withdraw from my investing account and into my bank account so your money is also accessible it doesn't have to be tied up in something for longer periods of time and of course investing is a long-term gain so you want to make sure you're doing that but if you need to have that as a revenue stream when we're talking about income streams also talking about things like investing, but also do you have anything you can rent out? Um, your house, your a room, a cabin, your timeshare, your car, a trailer, a boat, an RV. Um, so many people are now renting what they're not using on a regular basis and they're using services. Um, there's third party services you can use where you're not even handling this stuff. So increasing your income by using or not, with not using the things that you have around you. I know that we rented an RV um, this summer for use for like five or six days, but because uh, we don't have one. And so we wanted to rent one just because we were going on this little trip. And it was great for them. They said it tripled their monthly payment for what we paid for five days. So you just never know like what you can use to kind of offset some of your expenses. Um, a job is an income stream. A business is an income stream. Multiple businesses are income streams. You can sell things on, you know, Facebook Marketplace, eBay. Um, you can sell courses or books. You can have affiliate marketing. There's so many different opportunities out there and none of them have to take up a majority of your time. But the average millionaire has seven income streams. That means that money is coming in from seven different sources. No matter if it's passive or active, that's different. Um, because not all income is passive. Most of it's not. Some of it is. Like investing income is obviously passive. You put your money in and you get capital gains or interest or dividends, things like that. So if you have more time than you have money, then use your time to make money. If you have more money than you have time, then let your money work for you by investing in it and getting interest or dividends or capital gains on your money. And eventually you want to do both. Use your time and your money to make money for you. Earn more money. Use your money to invest in others who will help you make more money. So it's this constant you know, stream of going in and out of, of learning things. So always looking to add something. And it doesn't mean that you're doing all of the things. If you're trying to create seven income streams and you're actively trying to be in all seven of them, you're in a world of hurt. But one, it starts with one and then it's two and then it's three. Slowly add the income streams in there. Because relying on just one means if one of them goes down, your whole entire ship sinks. And as you're building your wealth, that's going to be a concern in the beginning, but as you're learning and growing, constantly be learning and growing for some other place. So always be looking for other additional income streams and ways that you can make money for yourself. And the last and final and most important, in my opinion, 
is number 10, wealth blocker. The lack of control of your own time. 168, guys. 168 hours a week. That's all you get. That's all any of us get. Anytime, anywhere, any place. 168 hours. What are you doing with yours? Because time is money. Just like you would look at your budget, like you would look at your finances, what are you spending it on? What are you spending your time on? Where are you wasting it? Just like our budget, because we're like, oh, spending's been out of control. Where are we wasting our money? And you look at your bank statements, it's right there in black and white. It's not so easy with our time. There are a few things that we can do to track our time, and most of it's going to be accountability. Some other things can be on your phone, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But where can you save a little? Where you can spend a little more? This is about your time. The most precious and valuable commodity on earth is your time. The end. It's not money. Because there's a whole bunch of people with a whole bunch of money that aren't making an impact in the world in their own lives. They could have a whole bunch of money, but... If their time is sucked up with other things, you know, how are they enjoying that? So it's just an example of time, right? Like Jessica, my daughter, works at the gas station, and she says she's got a co-worker. She's always complaining about being broke. She uses very, you know, little pocket change to buy chips at work. She's, But she's also always calling in. She's always calling off and saying, you know, I can't make it today, this, that, and the other thing. There's always an excuse. Oh, well, there was this. Oh, there was that. And Jessica's kind of like, hey, isn't this your own fault? Like, you say how broke you are all the time, yet you're always calling into work. Well, it's no wonder because you're not working because something else is obviously more pressing than that. So let's just own it. Let's own that we're responsible for our own time. And it's really not anybody else's fault. And I'm going to get tough with you guys here because I'm getting tough with myself too. I have to say these things out loud because I'm talking to me and to you. We're not intended to work 24-7. I'm not saying that you're, you're intended to work 24-7. Like rest and fun and relaxation is important. But honestly, if we're honest with ourselves, and I'm going to show you or walk you through a way you can be a little bit more honest with yourself just with your phone. Um, but... We spend a lot of time on things that we don't care about, that are not important to us. And that might be out of obligation. That might be out of what we assume is duty or we're just like saving face or we just can't say no and we're going to talk about that. But we spend a lot of time on things that, that really aren't important to us, that don't align with our priorities, that don't really, really don't like. And some of it is just bad habit and some of it is... Um, we're afraid to say no. We're afraid we're obligated. We're afraid that what are people going to think of me if I say no to this? But this is something, an exercise I want everybody to practice. I literally, if you're not walking, if you're not driving, if you're not doing something like that right now, I want you to do this right now. Like just take a minute and list the top five things that you care about the most. There are judgments here. I mean, there could, it could be a sport, it could be a hobby, it could be a thing, it could be whatever. But like, what are the most important priorities in your life? You know, a lot of us would say friends, family, um, our job, our business, our home, our pets, our hobby, our, our health, our exercise, our, our relationships. Okay, list what you care about most. I bet, I bet you. That as you're thinking through those things, that social media is not on your list. I bet social media, uh, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, these things are on your list of the most important priorities in your life. Yet, how many hours of our 168 a week are we spending on these things? right and this is how you can tell right every phone right now I know that it's both on iPhone and Android for iPhone you can go to settings and screen time and you can tap the turn on screen time and continue and then you can view your screen time report if you haven't done this for yourself or your kids it's really an eye-opening experience and it will literally give you a report to see all the activity of every app and how long you're spending on each app talk about an eye-opening, very humbling, crazy experience. Looking at that stuff, I'm like, wow. 
Android, it's going to settings, going on to digital well-being and even parental controls. And as soon as you tap on that, all of the recent screen time apps will come up and you can go app for app and see how long and how much your time you're spending on. This is very eye-opening because most of us on that priority list are listing things like friends and family and relationships and our jobs and our work and maybe our money. But how many hours are we spending on things that we really don't care that much about when it comes down to it? It's just habit. It's just something that we're doing to kill the time because maybe we're overworked and we actually need a break. And there's nothing wrong with social media and there's nothing wrong with relaxation and there's nothing wrong with chilling and watching a movie or watching TV. But in the end of the day, what is important to you? And are you spending time on what's important to you? Because we spend a whole lot of time on things that we really don't care that much about. Now, I said something out loud the other day, um, you know, kind of wrapping this up for you, is is I said this the other day, and it was really the same sort of eye-opening experience, is that my youngest one, she, it was Saturday morning, we just finished breakfast, and I said she needed to get her reading done for the weekend, which is about 30 minutes of reading. And she said, well, I don't have time for that. And I looked at the clock. It was 9.30 in the morning. I said, your bedtime is not until 10 p.m. You have 12 and a half hours to do a 30-minute task. I'm pretty sure you can get it done. And then I was like, wow. Just saying that loud, out loud made me super aware that I, too, had 12 and a half hours, or probably a little bit more, because let's be honest, I stay up till probably midnight, um, that I had that many, 14 hours to accomplish whatever I want. And that really made me super aware that there was plenty of time to do all the things that I wanted to do that day. Plenty. I could watch a three-hour football game, and I could make dinner, and I could make lunch, and I could go shopping, and I could do my hobby stuff, and I could play cornhole, and I could spend time with her playing some games and going places. I could spend time with my husband. There was plenty of time in that 14 hours, for me at least, To be able to do all the things I wanted to do and just saying that out loud. What if you got up every morning and said, I have 14 hours to spend today. How am I going to spend them? What is most important to me and what am I going to do to align my time with what's most important to me? And self-care can be most important to you. And that might be watching a movie on Netflix or catching up on a show or whatever. But like when you list those things... How often are we really concentrating and telling our time where to go rather than just mindlessly spending it and then going, what happened to it? So we can control what goes on our schedule. We can control what we say yes and no to. No is a complete sentence. So if somebody's asking you to do something or come to an event or do anything that doesn't align with your priorities and your goals, you can say no without obligation. If it doesn't align with most, what's most important to you, then it's just a no. And no explanation or excuses are required. Now, I know, friends, that I'm like that, too. I always want to say, I always want to give somebody lengthy explanations why I can't do something. When really... It's okay to just say no. Sorry, I can't make it. Or a yes, no, yes. Or a what I call it a yes, no, yes. Or like a praise, decline, suggest. Like here's a good example of like something somebody is inviting me to. Or, you know, recently I had to turn down a speaking engagement. And I was like, wow, that sounds amazing. Thank you for thinking of me. I am sorry I'm unable to make it. Please keep me in mind to keep me in the loop for the next time or I'd love to be notified of another event that's more aligned with my goals. I could have just said, sorry, I'm not able to make it. But I I gave them an explanation because I want to keep the door open. So even if it's friends or family, somebody's inviting you to an event or a gathering, it's just not aligned with what you're doing. Say, I'm sorry, that's not fitting into what I'm working on right now. But if you have any events surrounding e-commerce or surrounding this or that, I would love to connect um, with you at that time. Or this isn't a good fit for my family right now. There's always an answer to say no to protect your time. You are not obligated. You just get a question from me. You can even use me as your scapegoat if you want to. You can tell people, oh, sorry, Kristen told me that this doesn't align with my goals right now, so I have to say no. (laughs) What 
is that you need to feel comfortable. You say, my schedule is currently full. I'm not taking on anything new right now. That includes volunteering. That includes whether it's making cupcakes for a bake sale or attending a charity event. Even if these are really good things that you that you want to care about, you have to really align your choices with what kind of goals that you have and then own them and be happy about them because there's no room for guilt. You don't have to have guilt for saying no to something. Instead, have peace knowing that because you said no to that means that you said yes to things that are most important to you. Ultimately, you are in control of your wealth or lack thereof. And any one of these small steps that you can take to change it will help you stop blocking your wealth and start growing it instead. Remember, the steps are small. They don't have to be, you know, internet breaking, monumental kind of choices. Sometimes it's just saying yes to one thing and no to another thing that closely aligns with what you want. Because what you want is worth it. You're worth it. You're worth it. You are worth the work you're going to put in. Your family will thank you because you'll be a happier, healthier person. So I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to be able to hear what one of these you struggle with most and what you're going to be working on. I know that for me, I am going to specifically be working on um, the longer term goals and not having such a short term mindset because I've kind of operated in that for a really long time and I'm trying to grow out of it and start thinking a lot more long term. So that's what's it for me. What is it for you? Um, what are you going to be working on? Because 2022 is right around the corner and we have some time now to build time into our schedule to think about our goals and what we want and what we do. We are going to be doing some goal setting in the Amazon Files Hub next month. Uh, so I would love to have you guys uh, join the Hub so that you can be part of that goal setting and uh, do all that mommyincome.com slash Hub if you are interested in joining the Hub there. And... I know you guys could be anywhere else doing any other thing. Thank you for listening to the Amazon Files podcast. I don't take that for granted. I appreciate that. Please leave a quick review if you have literally one and a half minutes to write something and leave a star, five-star review for the Amazon Files. I would love that. Uh, happy holidays, and we will see you same time, same place next week on the Amazon Files.